if you have a look there in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 7, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The title of the sermon tonight is The Peace of God. And this is the fruit of the Spirit, part 3. Okay, we're going through the fruits of the Spirit. I'll just quickly read to you from Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. We've gone through that. Now peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we're looking at the fruit of peace tonight. Okay, the peace of God is what's important. Now we're going to come back to Philippians chapter 4 later on in the sermon. But I really want you guys to turn right now to John chapter 14 with me, please. John chapter 14, please turn there. Now, peace is called the fruit of the Spirit for a reason, okay, for a real reason. This is one fruit of the Spirit that you just consistently see in the Word of God that the only way you can attain this peace from God is through the Holy Spirit. The only way you can attain it is by walking in the spirit. So we're going to be doing a bit of a Bible study today, and we're just going to see the consistency that we see in the scriptures first of all. But John chapter 14, verse 25, John chapter 14, verse 25, Christ speaking about him leaving his disciples. And what did he promise is going to who's going to come when he leaves? That was going to be the Holy Ghost. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 25 there, John 14, 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, who is the Comforter, Jesus tells us, which is the Holy Ghost. Now look, if the Holy Ghost is given the title of Comforter, what do you think he's going to do to our lives? He's going to provide comfort, all right? And wouldn't you say, if you've been given comfort, then you are at peace, okay? You're given the peace of God. Let's keep reading there, verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And verse 27, look, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now verse 27 is awesome because it tells us the peace that, that peace does not come from the world. You know, if you're truly seeking peace in life, you're not going to find it in this, this world, in this sinful world. No, okay? This sinful world, like it says in verse 27, will give you troubles. This sinful world will make you afraid. And the pre- peace that Jesus Christ wants to give us is, is, is going to uh, uh, comfort us in trouble. It's going to alleviate those fears that we go through life in, okay? And he says, look, I, I leave you peace. Why is he leaving them peace? Because he's telling them, look, when I leave, the comforter is coming. He's going to give you that peace. He's going to give you that comfort. This is my peace I give unto you. Okay? And that, once again, is the comforter. If you leave it within the context of what he's been speaking there, spoken there. So the peace of Christ is the fact that the Holy Spirit would come, indwell our lives, and, and develop these fruits in the Spirit so long as we walk in the Spirit. Okay? But if we're seeking peace in this world, we're going to be left with the troubles, with the fears that the world gives us. So I just want to show you there the consistency that we see in the Bible. Turn to John chapter 16 now, just two chapters over. John 16 verse 33. John 16 verse 33. And this is again consistent with what we saw in John 14, but it says here, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. Jesus Christ wants us to live lives where we have peace, okay? Peace in Him, peace in this world. But look, it says here, in the world, you shall have tribulation. Hey, you're going to have problems in this world. There's going to be persecutions. Quite often when Christ speaks of tribulations, it's not just the troubles of this world, but quite often it's the persecution that comes by being someone that's a follower of Christ, Okay, but you say, well, Jesus, you just told us you give us peace. You you want us to be peaceful. Now you're guaranteeing us tribulation. What in the world? Hey, look, we can have peace even in the face of tribulation. Because look what he says there. But be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. So even if we're going through troubles, the struggles of life, God wants us to be of good cheer. Hey, that's, that's fruit of the Spirit number two, joy, cheer. I told you some of these things overlap. You, you, you cannot have joy in life unless you first have got the peace of God in your life. Okay? You truly can't have joy until you have peace. All right? So these things, a lot of these fruits do come together. But Jesus is telling us, look, even in the face of tribulation, you will have tribulation. Some people think that peace will come if I don't have problems. No, Jesus says even in the face of problems, you can still have the peace of God. Okay? So, now go to, uh, where, where can I get to turn to next? Go to Galatians, please. Galatians chapter 6. Go to Galatians chapter 6 for me. And I'm going to read to you from Romans 14, 17. You guys go to Galatians 6. I'm going to read to you from Romans 14, 17. Jesus said, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Pay attention to that. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. All right. So if you remember when I, what I taught about the kingdom of God, how it comes in three phases. If it's not meat and drink, it's not talk. It's not a literal kingdom. Okay. It's not a physical kingdom because we know in the millennium and in the new heavens and the new earth we are going to be eating and drinking and feasting and celebrating with the lord okay so it's not meat and drink meaning that it's the first phase of that kingdom you now the spiritual kingdom as it were that we enter by salvation okay so the kingdom of god is not meat and drink it's salvation but then it says but righteousness and peace and joy in the holy ghost it says Okay? The only way you're going to have that peace is in the Holy Ghost. The only way someone can have peace is to be saved, to have that spiritual kingdom in them. But it doesn't just say peace, it says but righteousness. And that's, uh, if you look at the fruits of the Spirit, one of them is goodness. That's very similar to righteousness. Okay, And peace, that's another fruit. And joy, it's another fruit in the Holy Ghost. I just want to show you how consistent the Bible is. The only way you're going to develop these fruits in your life, the only way you're going to be that happy, joyful person, that person with love, that person with peace, is if you maintain a walk in the Spirit, maintain a walk in the Holy Ghost. You guys are in Galatians 6, look at verse 15. Galatians 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Hey, look, the, the uh, circumcised represents the Jew. The uncircumcised there represents the Gentile. But this is talking about the physical flesh. It's talking about that old man that we, we unfortunately have to deal with. Okay, But notice that in Christ Jesus, what's important is the new creature. Okay, That's the new man. That's the spirit. All right? And then look at verse 16. But, and as many as walk according to this rule... What rule? According to what rule? According to the rule of the new creature. This is just another way of saying, walk in the Spirit. You know, walk according to the rule of the new creature. But as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. You see, peace can only come by walking in the Spirit. This is why, you know, the Bible, yeah, this, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just said over and over and over. The only way you're going to get this virtue of peace is by being in the spirit and uh just one more verse uh, if you guys can turn to romans 8 please romans 8 romans 8 romans 8 verse 5 romans 8 romans 8 verse 5 for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, look at this, is life and peace. All right? If you seek to walk in the flesh, to walk according to the flesh, or those that do not have the Spirit of God, their life will lead them to death. You know, for the wages of sin is death. You know, the only thing you can get out of this flesh without salvation, without the Spirit of God, is a sinful life that will lead you to death. But God wants us to have life 
and, and, and a life that is abundant, okay? And part of that is to have the peace, life and peace. Look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Hey, you know what? Your flesh, your carnal mind is an enemy of God. You know, it's at war against God. It wants you to sin. It doesn't want you in church. It doesn't want you reading the Bible. It doesn't want you developing the fruits of the Spirit. It's an enmity against God. And it says, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If you want peace in your life, guys, it's not going to come walking after the flesh. It's not going to be seeking the carnal things of this world. It's going to come by walking in the Spirit, by being led of the Spirit. You know, so please, you know, that's just a, a core teaching of the Bible. You're never going to have peace in the flesh. Now, what I'll get you to guys to do, please, is turn to, let's see, turn to the book of Daniel, please. Daniel chapter 10. I've got a lot of verses, obviously a bit of a Bible study today. Got a lot of verses, but I won't get you to turn to all of them. But you guys go to Daniel chapter 10. You see, when people think about peace, what's the opposite of peace? A lot of people think, and rightly so, that the opposite of peace is war. Okay, And we just saw there that the carnal mind is at enmity against God. It's at war against God, so that's true in a, in a sense. Okay? You know, and and when, 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 people, when there are nations at war, you know, it, people are seeking to make peace agreements, to, to, to bring peace into the world. And that's a reality of life. But you know, you yourself, you're not necessarily going to be at war at, you know, all the time you know, necessarily, against, against the world, against the forces of wickedness at all time. But peace, another opposite of peace is fear, is being afraid. And if you're someone that is afraid of certain things, that means you're missing out on the peace that God wants to give us, okay? I'm not talking about the fear of God. That's righteous. We ought to have a fear of God. If we have a fear of God, it's going to help us overcome the fear of man, okay? But we also need the peace that comes by Fearing God. All right, so I just want you to notice this. Well, I'll read to you from Judges 6.22 very quickly. Because quite often in the Bible, you'll have events when people are faced with an angel of God. Right? And, and, and what do they fear, feel? Quite often they're afraid, aren't they? They're fearful. I'll just read to you from uh, Judges 6.22. This is about Gideon. It says, And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. What's the opposite of, of fear in that context? It's peace. God wants to give Gideon peace. Yes, he's seen an angel of the Lord, but don't be afraid. You know, I come here bringing you peace. You guys are in Daniel chapter 10, verse 18. Daniel chapter 10, verse 18. Now, this is Daniel. It says, Then they came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. This is an angel that Daniel saw. They had an appearance of a man there in verse 19. And said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. You see there again the, the, the comparison between fearing and peace. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. You see, peace will give you spiritual strength. Peace will help you overcome fear that you can face in this life. And I'll just quickly read to you from John chapter 20, verse 19. And this is when, after Christ's resurrection, remember when his, the disciples were gathered together, it says in John 20, 19, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. You see, the disciples were gathered together. They stayed inside the house because they were afraid of what the Jews would do to them. After they had seen, they had crucified their Lord God. Then it says, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. See, Jesus comes in the, in the face of, the, of these disciples fearing the Jews. He says, look, I come and bring you peace. You don't need to be afraid. All right. Now, you see, fear, this is a, a, a feeling that we all have in our lives. We're, we're all going to go through, through fears in our lives. You know, when you're a child, you know, you might fear the darkness. You know, my kids, quite a few of them, 
don't want to go to sleep with all the lights off. We, we usually leave a light on somewhere in the house. You know, because, you know, there's a fear of the, of the darkness. Usually that's something when they're young and then they grow out of it when they get older. You know, but, you know, it's, a child has certain fears. And then as adults, we have other types of fears. You know, as men, we might fear that we don't have the ability to provide for our own home. You know, what if our family go without food or, and the things that they need? You know, or, or maybe we have fears of raising our children, you know, to, to, not, be, to not to love the Lord. Fears that they might go into the world and, and things like that. We all, we all, you know, throughout life, you're always going to face different types of fears, you know. And unfortunately for the unbelieving world, they have a fear of death. Now, we shouldn't fear death. Okay, we know we, we, got, we die. We're just with the Lord forever. We're going we're gonna to be more alive than we've ever been before, you know. We don't need to be afraid of that. But fear is a part of life. Fear is something that we're going to go through. But you see, fear stops you from accomplishing things that otherwise, you know, you would be able to do, you know. A lot of people don't go soul winning, for example, because they have a fear of what, you know, uh, you know what, what people will do at the door. I'll give you, you know, one quick example. Uh, you know, one of the men that's in my church in Sydney, he was attending another church. And uh, the pastor, yeah, he was writing the gospel, he was solid on it. But he never did any door-to-door soul winning. <laughs> you know, and, and, and this man was trying to get his pastor to go out there. And he told me the pastor was afraid. It was like saying, but don't people attack you? Don't people yell at you? Don't they tell you? It's like, yeah, sometimes. But you see, this pastor, you know, this supposed, supposed, you know, meant to be a leader in his church, was too afraid. You know, it, fear was stopping him from going out and preaching the gospel, which is the first works. <laughs> you know, one, one of the basic things. And, and um, you know, sometimes it might not be the fear of rejection. But it might be the fear of not being able to answer questions. Well, one of the first things that prevented me from going out soul winning, you know, in my Christian life was afraid that I'll be asked questions that I don't know of. You know, I was like, man, I've got to make sure I, give, I can give an answer to the atheists. I've got to make sure I can give an answer to the Muslims. I've got to make sure I can give an answer to the Roman Catholics and etc., etc., etc. And you start thinking, I've got to have all this knowledge before I go out there in case I get asked the question. And, you know... There was a fear of that, fear of, of not having an answer. And uh, that stopped me from going soul winning earlier in my life, you know. Only to find that was uh, a fear that wasn't grounded in anything. You barely get those kinds of questions that come your way. And you know what? When those questions come, you learn at the door. You know, you, oh, this question came, you, you do your research. Next time you're better prepared. So what? You're there to preach the gospel. You know the gospel. You can go out there, preach it. They ask you a question you don't know. You say, well, look, how about we, we tackle that question afterwards? Let me finish the presentation of the gospel. And then usually you won't even get to that question anyway, right? If, if you can get through the gospel. But, you know, fear will stop you achieving things that God wants you to do. There's the fear of failure. I'll just quickly read to you from Proverbs 24, 16. It says, for a just man. What's a just man? A righteous man. Someone that's in the Lord. Someone that's walking in the Lord. For a just man falleth seven times and rise up up again but the wicked shall fall into mischief hey look we shouldn't be afraid of failure okay if we have no fear if we're seeking to serve the lord we may fail sometimes we may fall a few times okay but the just man gets up again seven times okay failing once is not going to get you down you're going to just get back up again and continue on Okay? But that, that you need you know, the fear to be removed in order for you to be able to do that. Okay? We shouldn't fear failure. You know, if we fail, we just need to make sure we get... You know what we should fear? Is that when we fail, we don't get up again. That's, that's what the wicked do. You know, the wicked shall fall into mischief and they won't get out of that. But the righteous man, the just man will get back up again when he fails. All right? Now, I'll get you guys to turn to Philippians 4, please. Philippians chapter 4, where we, where we started reading from. Philippians chapter 4, you say, Pastor Kevin, yep, I understand now. I know what the source of peace is. You know, it, it's in Christ, it's in God. It's a fruit of the Spirit. If I walk in the Spirit, then I know, you know, the, the, that, that, uh, that fruit is available to me, peace. But how do I get it? You know, how do I get that peace? I know where, it's, I know where the source is, but how do I get it? Well, it's covered here in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And actually, before I read verse 6, I'll just read to you um, 
the end of verse 5 there, it says, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? <laughs> I've heard pre-tribulation teachers say, well, this proves a pre-tribulation rapture. The Lord is at hand. You can come at any moment. No, no, that's not what it's about. <laughs> Keep it within the context. The Lord is at hand, meaning he's close by. You know, if you need the Lord, he's available to you. He's close. He's not far. You know, if you need him, he's close. He's at hand. You can reach out and touch him, as it were. But look, he's at hand. Why? Verse 6, be careful. Now, when it, the, the context of careful here is to be full of care, full of worries, full of fears. So let's have a look at it with that mindset. It says, um, be careful for nothing. Hey, don't be full of care. Don't be full of fear. All right? Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. How do you overcome a life full of cares and, and fears? You go to the Lord in prayer. Just a very basic truth. You, you take your supplications. You, 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 you bring your needs before the Lord. But you go with thanksgiving as well. For the things that God has given you. Remind yourself how, how God has blessed you. You know, the great gifts that He's given you. Take those things to God in prayer. That's how you overcome fear. That's how you overcome the cares of life. Is you go to God and you leave it in God's hands. Let's keep reading there. In verse number 7, look at this. So once you've taken your prayer request to God and leave them there, please leave them with God. I've said it before and I make the same mistake. I pray to God about it and then I pick him back up again and I put them back on me and I'm still worried. I'm still care, you know, full of care. No, that's the wrong way. You, you take it to the Lord, you leave it you know, for God to take care of for you. Look, And then verse number 7, and the peace of God, that's what we want. We want the peace of God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep. It's like to guard, you know, to protect. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What a promise. And if we take our cares, our worries to the Lord, that He will give us His peace. Okay? This is how you know that you've left your worries and your cares with the Lord. When you finish praying, do you have peace? And if we're honest, we say sometimes, no, I take it to the Lord and I'm still worried. I'm still concerned. Then you, you haven't received the peace of God, meaning you've not left those worries and concerns in the Lord's hands. But there's been other times, you know, and usually these are the times I remember the most is when I'm worried. You know, I, I may have even, you know, shed tears for some concern or something. And then I take it to the Lord and I and now I feel like this huge burdens of my back. It's like it's in God's hands. God's in control. He's going to take care of it. And that's when you have the peace of God. You realize God knows. He's got it in His control. He's, you know, that's the peace of God that you need to be searching for. You know, make sure when you pray, you leave it in God's hands and you receive the peace that only God can give. But you know what? We need to maintain that peace. Once we have it, we need to make sure we maintain that peace in our lives. And let's keep reading there in verse number 8. This is so important, okay, so important to find peace in your life. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Hey, don't, don't think on, don't, don't be full of cares. Don't be full of worries. Don't keep thinking about how wicked and how evil and this, how this world is. You know, th there's a reason why I don't turn on the news. Okay, I, I don't care anymore. Because you turn on the news and all you see is the crimes and, the, and just how bad people are, the murders, the rapes, the kidnappings, the disasters. You know, and, and when you're watching the news day in, day out for half an hour, whatever you do, you know, you're, you're bringing on the fears of the world. But look, God says the things that are just, pure, true, lovely, good report. Think on these things. You know, it's good to go out and, and, and enjoy the nature that God has created. 
you know, we've got some beautiful beaches here. We have some beautiful rainforests. You know, just, just go out and see the things that are lovely. It's going to give you peace. You know, there was a time in my life when I was really into conspiracy theories. You know, and I still kind of am a little bit. But, you know, back then I, I'd look and I'd really want to know. You know, it, it'd be like this rabbit hole that you'd go down and, and you'd see the wickedness of this world. And it was really interesting. Like, you know, you do that, it's really interesting to see just how wicked this world is. And it shouldn't surprise us because God tells us, you know, you know that, that there are conspiracies in this world. But what I found, when I, when I dug in too deep, when, I, when, 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 when mentally I was just thinking on, on the wickedness of this world, I realized I was losing the peace of God. You know, it, it was taking up my mind. I started to get depressed. And I used to get, I got, you know, anxious and, and uh, you know, worried. You know, am I, am I being, you know, spied on? You know, are, are people, maybe, maybe I am, but who cares? You know, Christ said here, over, he's overcome the world. Okay, there's going to be tribulation, yes, but God wants us to have peace. Even knowing, we, we, ought to know, we already know the world is wicked. We already know that Satan is the prince of this world, as it were. Okay? So we don't, we don't need to spend all our day, all our time, looking at the wickedness of this world. And, you know, just be aware of it. It's good. But seek the things that are good and lovely. Fuel your mind with these things. That's how you're going to have the peace of God. Let's keep reading there in verse number 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you okay so how do we have how do we attain peace our cares and worries in prayer we leave it in god's hands we have the peace of god now what do we do we think on things that are lovely things that are true the things that are righteous we think of the things of god you know and uh that will maintain you know the fellowship with god who's the god of peace in you that's how you're going to have a peaceful life okay Turn to, uh, let's have a look, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. How else can we have peace? You guys turn to Ephesians 2, which is not really at this point that I'm looking at here. But how else can we have peace? You know, in my experience, believers, Christians... We don't pray, generally speaking. We don't pray for our government. We don't pray for our politicians, generally speaking. You know, because we don't like them. <laughs> we don't really want to pray for them. You know, because especially, you know, when we see them bringing in laws that are contrary to the Word of God, you know, if anything, maybe you're praying for their destruction. I mean, maybe that's how far you go. Okay, but look, I'll just read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says... I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all, uh, and for all that are in authority. Say, no way. I don't want to pray for them. It says, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You want peace? God says, pray for the authorities, pray for the kings, pray for the politicians, pray for the governor. All right? Say, well, what are we praying for? We're praying for peace is what we're praying for. Okay? Well, what I mean by that is we're not praying for their peace. We're not praying that they succeed and have a great political career. No. We're praying that they would maintain, you know, religious freedom in this earth, in, in this nation, so we can continue coming to church. We can continue reading our Bibles. We can continue going out door to door, preaching the gospel. You know, that the things that God commands of us would not become unlawful, would not become crimes. Because here's the thing. Where if the government made the commands of God unlawful, let's say it was a crime to go soul winning. Do we listen to the government or do we listen to the Lord? We've got to listen to the Lord, don't we? But if we listen to the Lord, you know, you're going to face persecution in that environment. You know, and, and you might be arrested. You know, you, you, that might all happen. And so you, you lose the peace that you have in this nation. Hey, you want to maintain religious freedoms, you know, to serve the Lord. We ought to be praying that these politicians would have a fear of God. 
Okay, when they pass laws, it would not be contrary to the laws of God. You know, so we can serve Him in righteousness. So please keep that in mind. We've got to pray for our politicians. Okay, and it's not how you think of it, but that we would be able to live peaceful lives serving the Lord. Now, you guys are in Ephesians 2.14. Let's talk about Jesus. And one of his names, one of his titles is the Prince of Peace, isn't it? The Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ came and brought peace. In Ephesians 2.14, speaking about the differences between the Old Testament Jews, you know, Israel of the Old Testament, and the Gentiles, the heathen nations, whose God was not the God of Israel. We'll just pick it up from verse 14. It says, For He, speaking of Jesus, for He is our peace, who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Hey, we can be numbered amongst the Old Testament saints, amongst Abraham, Isaac, you know, Moses and King David, all the great men of God. That middle wall partition has been broken because Christ has come and brought peace between the Jews and the Gentiles in Christ. In Christ. All right? 15, verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. Look, so making peace. Okay? You want, to make, you want to have peace between, you know, Israel and the Gentiles? It's only found in one new man, okay? In Christ Jesus, as it were, all right? In, in that one body of Christ. Now, this is what frustrates me about my fellow brethren, my fellow independent Baptists that believe in dispensationalism to the point where they say the Jews are some other group of people of the Lord, okay? You know, and they're trying to to uh, love the Jews, as it were, you know, to, to heighten their standard in, in the world, you know, thinking they're doing a righteous thing. But what they're doing is breaking or, or, or re, recreating, rebuilding that middle wall of partition. Say, well, God has two peoples. Why? When Christ has taken down that wall and he's brought peace, so making peace by doing that. Meaning when you build that wall up, wall up again and you say there are two peoples of God, what are you doing? You're removing the peace that Christ has brought in. You're bringing in enmity. You're making enemies, you know, because of your racist remarks. And yes, it is racism when you favor one nation or one people above another. Okay? Verse 16, Ephesians 2, 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, I love it, with the saints and of the household of God. Hey, we're fellow citizens with the Old Testament saints, with every believer of every nation. You know, God came and brought, Jesus Christ came and brought peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay, and it can only be found in Christ Jesus. That's where the peace is found. All right. Now I'll get you guys to turn to. Let's have a look. Turn to Colossians chapter one, please. Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. And uh, this isn't. I, I've made it a separate point, but it's kind of the same point. Okay. But God, obviously, Jesus Christ came and brought peace between God and man. Between God and man. What an amazing thing. Because we already saw that the carnal mind. We already saw that the flesh is that enmity against God, is that war against God, okay? And um, let's, uh, you guys turn to Colossians 1, and I'm just going to read to you from Romans 10, 15, and it's a familiar passage to many of you. It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It's a beautiful thing that the gospel we preach is known also as the gospel of peace. And the reason why it's known as the gospel of peace is because it brings peace between God and man. Okay, you believe the gospel, you now have peace with God. You find peace with God. You guys are in Colossians 1, look at verse 19. 
for it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace, how? Through the blood of his cross. So, you know, it's just the amazing thought. Just, you know, thinking of Christ on the cross, the torture, the shedding of blood that he went through, the pain and the suffering that he went through. But he does that for peace, you know? Something so vile, something, you know, I probably wouldn't even be able to look and see a man crucified on the cross. You know, let alone Jesus who was whipped and the crown of thorns and all that, you know? But it was for the peace. It says, by him, in verse 20, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they, they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have you reconciled. Hey, we were enemies of God, and He's reconciled us through His blood. Verse 22, In the body of His flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Wow, what a peace that God has given us, that we would be holy, unblameable, unreprovable, faultless, as it were, to stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. So Christ has come and brought peace between God and man. And I do want to finish up on, 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 on one key thought here, though. Please turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Because I think we all want peace. You know, we all want life that we're without fear, we're without, you know, hardships and, and, and fightings and warfares. But just like anything with the fruits of the Spirit, like when we spoke about love, that's not to say we shouldn't have hatred, all right? And just when we spoke about joy, you know, it's not to say that, you know, we should rejoice in the things of this world or rejoice in things that are sinful. There's always something to go with these fruits that you need to also have into consideration. Because one thing you need to understand is that we shouldn't strive for peace at all costs, okay? We shouldn't strive for peace at all costs costs okay let me let's look at this in james chapter 3 verse 14 james chapter 3 verse 14 now we'll start off here but it says but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts now if you have bitter envy and strife you're obviously lacking peace right you're lacking the peace of god there it says glory not and lie not against the truth this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay? But look at this. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Actually, it's verse 17 here. It says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Look at this. Pay attention to these words, please. But the wisdom that is from above, God's wisdom, is first pure, then pure. Peaceable. There is something that is more important, that's a higher priority in God's eyes than peace. What is that? Purity. Things that are pure. Okay? The righteousness of the truth of the Word of God, the pure words of God come first before peace. Okay? I'll read, I'll read the rest of it to you later, but I just want to explain this to you. Okay? Because a lot of pastors, a lot of churches, in the effort to find peace amongst all men, will not preach certain passages in the Bible. Okay? Because they know if I preach this, if I even read this, it's going to cause people to leave my church. It's going to cause people to have arguments. It's going to cause people to be confused or whatever. Okay? But no, something more important than finding peace amongst men is that we have the purity that comes from the wisdom above. Okay? Purity, righteousness, that what is true must come first. First pure, then peaceable. All right? So, let's take, you know, the homosexuals. All right? A good example of that. All right? So, if I, you know, a lot of pastors, they want to have peace amongst their members. They want to allow the homos to come into the church. They're just going to hide the truth. They're not going to preach what's pure, what's true, and what's right. Okay? But no... God says what's pure must come first. You preach what you must preach. 
Okay? And if that causes division, so be it. If it causes problems, so be it. Pureness, purity has a higher priority in God's eyes than peace. So teach what's pure, teach the whole counsel of God, then worry about the peace. All right? Find peace afterwards. But don't neglect what's pure and what's true. Okay? So always, these things, these fruits of the Spirit, must always be put in the right areas of life. Okay? And we see here in this verse here, in verse 17, we'll keep reading. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So we have another sort of a, another kind of list of the fruits of the Spirit there. Okay? But what's pure, what's right, must come first. Okay? It's not peace at all costs. Okay? Not at the cost of purity. Okay? You know, another example, maybe just a, you know, a day-to-day example. You know, you might have mates that are unsaved, work colleagues that are unsaved. You know, they might tell the dirty joke or whatever, or they might invite you out for a, you know, to the bar, you know, to have, have some alcohol with them or something, to have a beer, you know. And you might say, you know what, to find peace with these people, I'm just going to laugh at their dirty jokes. I'm just going to go to the bar. I won't even drink. I'll just, I'll just go there. You know, I'll find peace with these people. No. First, purity, please. Okay? Keep yourself pure first. If that means there's no peace, then so be it. You know, you have the right priorities in place, you know. So, yeah, please just have that as your mindset, you know. When I'm finding peace, am I first being pure? Am I being true to the Word of God first? And this is why Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34, He says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. (laughs) Right? Because what's pure and what's right will cause divisions. And the context of that is even divisions within your own family. Okay, when you stand for the truth of God's word, it's going to cause problems. You know, you tell people in your own family, show them passages of the death penalty. You show them passages about the reprobate. You show them passages where God darkens the hearts, hardens the hearts of people and blinds the eyes of people that they cannot believe. You know, they cannot receive it because they're trying to find peace with everybody. But no, what's pure must come first. Okay, don't, don't neglect the Word of God just to find peace even in your own family. Let's, uh, let's turn to Genesis 15, please. Genesis 15. I'm near the end now, guys. But I just want to show you the first mention of the word peace in the Bible. I think it's relevant, the first mention here. It's in Genesis 15, verse 13. Like many things that are first mentioned are found in the book of Genesis This is God prophesying about Abraham. Or he's telling Abraham about his future, as it were. But in Genesis 15, verse 13, it says, Genesis 15, 13, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. God prophesies about their, that, that Israel, the children of Israel will be taken in bondage in, uh, in Egypt. And then it says in verse 14, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. But look, it says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, but thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Now, you know what? One of the things I think we all kind of want in life is to get to our old age, to get to the time we know we're going to pass on, and we pass on with peace. You know, and and part of that is knowing where we're going. Of course, you know, I mean, I've heard stories of people that have seen their loved ones die. They've seen literally the ghost leave the body, as it were, not physically, you know, but, you know, they've seen that point of, of death. And those that are without Christ, those that don't know eternity, a lot of the stories I hear is that there's a fear in them. There's a fear in their eyes. You know, I've even heard stories, and I don't know if these are true, but there's so many of them, where people start s- screaming in fear. It's almost like they're already, they're already there. They're already looking at hell, and they know where their eternal destination is, you know, because they're missing out on the peace that comes from God. 
No, I want to get to the end of life and have peace. Not just peace of where I'm going. I know that I have that peace already. That peace that I've lived my life for the Lord. That I've served Him faithfully. You know, that I'm going to, when I stand before God, He's not going to deny me. You know, He's going to, to praise me, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want to see in my life. And we see God, you know, tells Abraham here, yeah, you can have peace into your last days, into your old age. You're going to have that peace, you know. And uh, peace at death. I think that's something we all kind of really want to strive for. And I'll just read to you from Psalm 37, 37. It says, mark that perfect man. What does it mean to be perfect? It means to be righteous, to be made whole, someone that is saved. And it says, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Hey, we should be people that even in the face of tribulation, maybe even at the point of, of, uh, of death, as it were, you know, we should be people that are known to go into eternity with peace. Okay, the peace that comes from God. Please turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to finish on this. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. I think it's a good passage to end on. It says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are called, uh, thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. Hey, we should strive to have peace amongst the church be of one mind have the mind of christ you know if someone rails against you don't render rail for railing evil for evil you know seek to be have peace in the church verse number 10 for he that will love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile let him eschew evil and do good let him seek peace and ensue it okay Seek peace and ensue it. Now that word ensure, if you're not that familiar with, it's, it's very similar to the word pursue. Okay, when you pursue something, what are you doing? You're chasing after it. Okay, you're chasing after that thing. But usually when you, when you talk about pursuing something, usually you're, you're chasing after it uh, for a harmful reason. Usually, when you're pursuing something. You know, when the police is pursuing you, it's because they want to... Uh, you know, give you that ticket or whatever it is, right? Something, something that's harmful. But the word ensue, ensue is to follow after, you know, to attain, you know, seek to attain, seek to hold on to this thing. Verse number 11, let's look at it again. Let him eschew evil. Hey, get away from the harm, you know, cast it away, do good. Let him seek peace. God wants us to seek the peace, the fruit of the Spirit, that comes by walking after Him and ensue it. He wants us to take it, hold on to it, follow after it. This is a key thing in our lives, you know, that God seeks for us to do. But again, brethren, just one more time. You're not going to find peace in the pleasures of this world. It's not there, okay? All this world's going to give you are troubles. It's all it's going to give you are fears. If you've got fears in your life right now, you know, you can overcome those fears, you can have the peace of God, you know, if you walk in the Spirit and you ask this God to please, you know, take those things, take those thoughts, please, you know, look after those fears that I have. You know, uh, just right now, we're looking for a house. You guys know, we're looking for a larger house for our family. There's a few available, but we put our offer in. I think I, I give a good offer. I give, I, I put in more than they ask. You know, I sell payments three months in advance, you know, and then... As soon as they see the 10 kids, as soon as they hear about it, it's like your application has been rejected, all right? And sometimes you look at a house, and we've gone with Christina, we looked at some, and we set our hearts on it. It's like, oh, man, this would be so cool, you know? And, and then when you get rejected, it's like a crush. It's like, oh, man, you know? But you know what? It, even through this process, and this isn't a big issue, but there's peace. You know, I, I know the Lord's going to provide for us. You know, and, and the reason for that, you know, when I moved up here to start this church in Queensland, if you guys remember, we got our house a week before the church started. A week before the church started. You know, I mean, I could have been afraid. I could have been fearful. Say, God, where am I going to rest my head? 
You know, what's going to happen? Are we going to move? We've already got everything organized. Everything's packed. Where are we going to go, Lord? But for some reason, during the, the, you know, we had a peace. We just knew that God was going to sort it out. Because I knew God wanted me here. I knew God wanted this church to exist. You know, so I knew if he's going to, you know, if, if this is a work that God wants, then he's going to provide that house. It's going to work out. Now, I, I don't know if we'll ever get the, the house that we're looking for right now, the bigger house. Nevertheless, we have the one we've got. If that's what we're left with, we have peace in our family. You know, we're, we're comfortable. We have the peace of God. But if God has something else in mind for us, then so be it. And that's what it means to be at peace. You know, even w- when you can't attain the things that you're trying to attain, you just know that God's in charge. God's taking care of it. You know, I don't have to worry about it. I'll focus on the things that are lovely, the things that are true. You know, I'll focus on those things. And I'll let God deal with the, with the, with the, the trials in life because he's already overcome the world. All right, let's pray.